everybody. Um, yeah, that was just a very powerful time of just being in the presence of God. And it's actually interesting because that's very much in line with what today's message is all about. Um, but yeah, with that, welcome to news. Um, oh, just some turnout today. Not bad, not bad. You can just see some old faces. How's everybody doing? Especially Lynn. <laughs> all right, so um, for, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, we've been going through the book of Hebrews. And uh, we're, we're actually getting kind of towards the end of it. And so if you're here for the first time, you're going to feel a little bit like, uh, a little confused. We've been building up at this point. I'll try to explain that as best I can. Um, but today, I want to start off by asking you a very simple question. Do you prefer new? I was going to say or old, but everyone's going to say, I don't like anything old, so I said or vintage. <laughs> Do you prefer new or vintage? What do you guys think? Please. Throw some vintage. things up. Vintage. Vintage. Oh, see, that's a trendy thing. You guys are all hipsters, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Go take your, you know, your, your fixed, fixed range bicycles and messenger bags. <laughs> um, like, do, do people actually like thrift stores? I know it's not popular in Korea. Um, like, do they have thrift stores in Korea? Do they? You get one? Like, uh, I remember that I didn't know what thrift stores were until my sisters were in high school, because they got into it. Because my sisters were hipsters before hipsters existed. <laughs> so they were always doing, like, these very trendy things before they became trends. And so one of those things was going to, like, these, uh, you know, these thrift stores and buying, like, these old, like, clothes from, like, the 70s, because they look cool. Um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. But, um, okay. Any anybody else? New or vintage? How about cars? Vintage. Oh, vintage. Wow, we got we got an American back there. <laughs> Riley, what, what kind of what kind of vintage cars do you like? I like really, really old cars. Like 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 the original, like Model T. <laughs> okay, so like the old school style Fords. Okay, interesting. Anything else? Oh, we have a, people that are really into vintage things. I was, I'm a little surprised. I wasn't expecting that. Um, like, personally with cars, when you can buy new, it's nice. Because you don't have to worry about the car for like five years. Right? When you get it a little bit older, like, you know, there's a lot of love and care you have to put into it. And it, it's, like, honestly, cars in general, it's not an investment. Right? You're going to lose money no matter what. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's always kind of interesting that, um, some people like restoring the classic style of things, okay? Um, today we're going to be talking about new and old, but it's going to be about covenants, so I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, how's everybody doing with this weather change? Today is like, it's like seriously fall. Right? <laughs> some people are cold. Um, I, I know some of our people don't handle the cold very well. My, myself, you know that I'm very well made for cold weather. Um, <laughs> I think for me, the thing that I'm struggling right now these days is the mosquitoes are not dead yet. <laughs> right? Like, they're slower because it's, co it's colder, so they're easier to catch. But what's been amazingly surprising me is there's so many. I think the other night I caught six. Normally, two or three, and I'm good. But I just kept catching them. Like, they kept waking me up, and a total of about six. And it's bad because that particular night, I found one on the ceiling in my bathroom. And I was so excited, and I, I got it. But as I hit the ceiling, I knocked down the glass enclosure for the, the light, and I fell on the, the ground and shattered everywhere. And it was kind of late, so I didn't really do the greatest job of cleaning it up. So since then, I've been dealing with like shards of glass embedded in my feet. <laughs> and it's a constant reminder, because like, it keeps happening, and I can't get them out. So it's like, I'm walking, I'm like, oh, <laughs> mosquitoes. <laughs> anyway. Okay, that was big tangent. So let's go to Hebrews 8, <laughs> starting with verse 1. Um, <clears throat> open your Bible, smartphones, look at the screen. Hebrews 8, starting from verse 1. The word, of, uh, the word of the Lord says this. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. 
Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on the earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the, that first covenant, no, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant and the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Amen. Now, some of you might be a little confused, and I'll try to explain as much as I can, um, but we've been going through this theme of Transformers for all of this year. We started with the Book of Romans, and we saw how God is transforming us through the Gospel and now understanding that he in turn desires us to be agents of change and transformation to those around us. Um, the book of Hebrews, I'll, I'll try to go through this as quickly as I can, but it, it, you start and, and you see that, first off, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. So I'm often going to say the author, because we don't really know. Um, there's a common thought that it might have been Priscilla, which is a very cool thought, so I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, you might have written this, Priscilla. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, that, that's kind of an interesting thought, uh, but we really don't know who wrote this book. But we do know who this person wrote the book to. The audience is most likely second generation Jewish Christians. So these are not people that know Christ personally. They have come to the faith, but they're in a position where they're starting to backslide. They're actually returning back to the Jewish faith. And so this author is pleading with them and, and explaining to them. So there's a lot of stuff about Judaism that's been coming out. And so starting with chapter 1, the author talks about how it's really trying to explain, you'll see in each chapter, who Jesus is, and compares Jesus to angels, and says, Jesus is greater than angels. You don't want to worship angels, you want to worship God. Jesus is God. Very, from the beginning, chapter 1, Jesus is God. Chapter 2, but Jesus is also man. Jesus lowered himself. He suffered for the sake of raising us up so that we can be brothers and sisters, just like he is the firstborn of God. And continuing on, um, there's an encouragement. He's compared against Moses and said that he's greater than Moses. And, and that generation that was with Moses that experienced God on a day-by-day -day basis in the wilderness, they still disobeyed, they still fell away. So there's an encouragement. Let's not fall away. Let's listen to the Word of God. Let's, let's live out what He is speaking and proclaiming to us. And, and the reason for that is when we live in obedience, God wants to bring us into the place of rest, His Sabbath rest. And that requires us to fully trust in Him and to fully obey just as Christ did for us. And then that leads to the, the next one of, of Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is this, 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 this priest that is interceding for us each and every day, keeping us in relation with God. But Jesus Himself showed a model of obedience. That He was obedient even unto death. And so with that... There, there's that, 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 you know, that, that thought of move on from milk, move on to solid food, move on in, in maturity, and know that God keeps His promises. And last week we talked about Melchizedek. A lot of people are like, well, who's Melchizedek? And it kept coming again and again. And, and Melchizedek is this mysterious character in the Bible that the author proves very clearly was greater than even Abraham. For every Jew, the greatest person that they can compare themselves is Abraham. He's the, the father of, of Judaism, right? And what the author shows is there was this, this, this figure named Melchizedek who was greater than Abraham, and God said that he would send a, a priest in the order of Melchizedek. There was a future person to come, and that is Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is of that nature. And I even gave the further argument, Melchizedek may have been Jesus himself before he came in the manger. So you have this build-up. There's been this, this build-up that's going on. The author is showing Jesus is this, Jesus is this, Jesus is greater than this, Jesus is greater than this, and warning the, the audience again and again. Pay attention. Be mature. Give, like, stop drinking milk. Move on to solid food. Let's move on to higher teaching. And now we're getting into this covenant. And so it starts off this passage we're talking about, again, this high priest, this high priest from the order of Melchizedek, who's not just priest forever, he is king forever. And in that way, he sits at the right hand of God in the throne room in heaven. And he serves at this true tabernacle, not this imitation that's on earth. And so, so we're given this image, again, of who Christ is and the fact that he is bringing a new promise. Now, the interesting thing when he talks about, um, when the author talks about the tabernacle, you guys know what the tabernacle is? I'm not talking about the temple. What's the tabernacle? Tabernacle is a big one. You'll camp in these things. Come on, guys. It's a big tent, right? So, so in the wilderness, there was this big elaborate tent, right? This was glamping before glamping existed here in Korea. So, so there was this big tent, right? And, and if you look at the book of Exodus, the detail in this tent is ridiculous. It's like the last, I think, maybe third of, of the book of Exodus, it's all details about this tent. And this passage kind of indicates when it talks about how Moses was required to follow the instructions exactly. Some people actually think that when Moses was on Mount Sinai, God showed him a picture of heaven. And showed him a picture of what it looked like. And that's what he was trying to imitate in this tabernacle. And that's why there's so much detail. There's so much, like, so much like, very intricate details in the explanation of this tabernacle. I don't know how true that is. But regardless, what this passage does tell us is, as elaborate as this tent was, it's just a copy it's just a shadow. It's not the reality. And the tabernacle itself represents the presence of God. Right? Before the tabernacle existed, there was a tent of meeting where Moses and, and Joshua, they, they were the only ones allowed into this tent. It was far away from the camp. And whenever God showed up, there would be this, this pillar of cloud called the Shekinah glory that would show up. They were the only ones allowed in that presence. The rest of the, the camps, they would be far away. Whenever they see this pillar of cloud come, they would worship from afar, knowing that God was speaking to Moses and Joshua. But Moses said, God, I don't want this anymore. Show me your glory. That, that famous story where he says, show me your glory. And God passes by him, and, and he gets to see the back of God. And, and after that, that's when they build the tabernacle. Because when the tabernacle is built, the presence of God goes from being far away to being to the very center of the camp. That's what the tabernacle represented, that God was among his people. And for those of you that know about this, you know, like I, I've talked about how, how Jesus Christ himself, you look at John 1, verse 14, and it talks about, and he made a dwelling among us, when it's talking about Jesus, the word. That verb, made a dwelling among us, is actually tabernacle among us. Really meaning that Jesus was God, literally dwelling among his people. The presence of God walking with his people. And further still, to kind of jump a little bit further ahead, is you guys all know that we ourselves are called temples of God. Right? From, 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 uh, from 1 Corinthians, that we are temples. And what that means isn't, isn't so much about like take care of your body. Yeah, that's important. But it's more about the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So we have been given an access to God that has never existed before. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is this, that's kind of what, what is being talked about later on. But right now, what, what this author is saying is that tabernacle, which had now become a temple, is nothing more than a shadow. So this was a group of people that were going back to this faith. And what the author is warning them is, you're going back to worshiping in a counterfeit of what is real. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, um, and so the author continues and talks about how Jesus is superior. His covenant is superior. There's so like this whole book, the author has been telling the the audience, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. His promise is greater. 
And so, what's wrong with this first covenant? Now, a couple weeks ago, I actually talked about all the covenants in the Old Testament. I talked about, um, you know, Noah. What, what's the what's the sign of the the Noah covenant? Rainbow. rainbow, right? And what was the promise when God showed that rainbow? He will never destroy like He did then, right? He would never do that again. That was what the rainbow represented after the flood, right? And so, um, so then I talked about the, the Abrahamic covenant, um, where, where Abraham is promised to be a blessing, how he's promised that he would be a, given a, a son and land. Uh, we, we talked about the Mosaic covenant, which was, was about God really becoming, um, like the Israelites becoming the people of God, and, and then being given the law, which gave them all these intricate details about who God is, but gave them a lot of things to do. Right? This is the promise that is being talked about. When, when this passage is talking about the Old Covenant, it's talking about the promise to Moses. So when Israel, these people had become the people of God, it also put them in a different lifestyle. It also put them in different things that they were supposed to do. But unfortunately, they didn't do a very good job. Now for those of you that, that know the story of Israel, that have, have looked at the Old Testament, like, it's almost comical how badly they follow God, right? Like, honestly, like the story of the golden calf, which many of you know, like, you know, I remember, like, you know, hearing this, I'm like, what? Didn't God just bring them out of Israel? Like, it's only been, I think it's literally been like a month after they got out of Egypt. Why did I say Israel? So, so you know, God brings them out of Egypt, and he does all these crazy miracles, and then they get bored. Moses goes up in the mountain, and like the mountain itself is like on fire. So it's like it's still clear that God is there, right? But they're like, oh, Aaron, we need something to worship. So they're like, okay, uh, let's get some gold. They get some gold, and they they melt it down, and like, let's make a cow. <laughs> and they make this golden cow, and they worship it, right? And this is what is going on when Moses finally comes down. Right? He's like coming down with these stone tablets with the Ten Commandments and all these other things written on it. And he's so angry, he just like throws them down and breaks them, right? And it's like, like Moses is angry, right? Um, and, and so like that's like the story that we see. But honestly, when we get to it, when we really examine our own lives, we kind of do the same thing, right? Like how many times have we had this encounter, this experience? Um, you know, maybe you go on a retreat, maybe like something like amazing happens to you and it really renews your faith, really encourages you and challenges you to go further. How many times have that happened and then literally like a week later you're like doing something stupid? Like that, that's like honestly the, the same experience that I think many of us go through. And so what, 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 what was pro the problem with this first promise that God had given the people of, of Israel was that God found fault with them they did not remain faithful. So basically, brothers and sisters, we're the problem. God gave us a promise. He gave us all these different things. We couldn't measure up. We were the problem. And so God realizes. He's like, I got to do something about this. And so what had basically happened, this is a very, like, kind of, you know, nerdy phrase, but basically what I'm trying to explain is that What, why, what God wanted was a relationship. When you look at the Old Testament, many times you see that what had actually happened at Sinai, in many ways, was a marriage. The people of Israel became the covenant people. They, they came into a relationship with God. And when you look out to the, at the Bible, especially look at like Song of Songs, right? It's a, it's a very like, you know, like, be careful when you read that because it's kind of like, whoa. <laughs> it's a hot and heavy book, but what it's really showing is that is the love that God has for his people. Right? And we see this much more clearly in the New Testament that God desires us. God contends for us. Like the stories of like um like you know Luke uh what was it Luke? Sorry. Um, uh, you know, the, the lost son, the lost coin, the, the, the parable son. Like, those, those are all 15 or 10. 15, right? <laughs> so, anyway, um, so you have these stories where, where, where it's showing that God pursues. God is, is actually 
pursuing us. That is, is really the, the image of what God desired. But what had happened was, this had become religion. It had become about a place. First it started with the tabernacle, which is what God gave them to show them His presence. But then it got elevated up to this temple. Who wanted to make the temple? You guys know? Hmm? Speak it out. David, right? David wanted to build a temple. So he's like, man, I'm in this nice house. I'm in this nice palace. And God is in the tent. That's not right. And so he's like, I want to make a house for God. And so God speaks to him through a prophet. And he's like, you want to build me a house? I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a house that's going to last forever. And so God turns it around. And so eventually David doesn't get to build the temple. Who builds the temple actually? Solomon, right? His son. So God, God allows Solomon, his son, to build this temple. This temple is like, like you know, the nicest thing that Israel ever accomplishes. Right? It's like, you know, it's arguably a world wonder, not quite, but it's like their pride and joy, this, this amazing temple. But the reality of it was, was God never asked for that temple. It was something that David desired. So he honored that request. But what ended up happening was, from the building of that temple, all worship was centered around that building. So much so that if you were a good Jew, even if you didn't live in Jerusalem, there were multiple festivals per year, I think about five or six, you had to come back because you could only worship at the temple for that time. Right? So again, if you put that, as I've said before, in our context, let's say we're like, you know, let's say, like, okay, most of us are Koreans here, so let's say, okay, all Koreans, like for Chuseok, Salah, Christmas, and Easter, you have to come back and worship at this one building in Seoul. Right? Think about how crazy that would be. That would be kind of annoying, for one thing. Um, but that that's... That's how it was in, for the Jews, was that everything was centered around this one building. And that building was first destroyed, right? God allowed it to be destroyed. It was eventually rebuilt, but then it was destroyed again. And so actually, if you talk to very strict Jews, they're waiting for the third temple. That's what all they care about. They're waiting for that third temple. That third temple may happen quickly. That's what many of them still proclaim today. So really, it went away from a relationship to religion. You could only worship God in one place. When you go to that place, there were different levels. Not everybody could enter into the presence of God. Only the high priest, as I mentioned before, could only enter into that most holy place where the presence of God was thickest once a year. And so you go from relationship to levels. And you go and you have to give sacrifices all the time. Every time you do something wrong, you got to give a sacrifice. And so what ended up happening was, rather than relationship, you're constantly doing, doing, doing to get into good standing with God. This was about earning your, your salvation. This wasn't about knowing God. That's what it eventually happened. And so God says, this is all wrong. And so this new covenant, which is actually quoted in its entirety in this passage, comes from Jeremiah 31, in verses 31 to 34. And in the new covenant, this is actually in the context when God gave this message, the Jews were exiled. They were already living outside of, outside of Israel. They were, they were under oppression. The temple had been destroyed. Everything seemed like it was lost. Right? And God gives this message, I will bring something new. And so this is the new covenant. So let me go over some of this. Where it says, I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. What, what God is saying is, is what my word, my law, had become a burden on you. But I want to write it on your heart. I want it to be a thing of joy. And the thing, like the interesting thing is, I'll emphasize this again later, but he's saying everything with I, I, I. God is saying, I want the word to be a blessing to you. And like, even our Bible study this past weekend, we, we talked about how, how Jesus wanted to give living water, right? 
The Word is meant to be that living water, that, that, that replenishing uh, to our spirit again and again. That, that's what the Word of God is supposed to be, not a burden. I will be their God, and they will be my people. God wants to give us that identity that we are His people. And I love the next one. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. <laughs> like, like that's, that's the intensity that God wants to have an intimacy with each and every one of His people. That no one wouldn't know the Lord. Everyone would have that personal connection, that relationship with Him, regardless of who they are. And He promises, I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. That is inhuman, right? Forgetting the sins of others forever. Because we don't do that. <laughs> you can forgive someone, you, you really can't forget. <laughs> that's, that's human, right? When, when someone does wrong to us, we can get to a point where we forgive them, but it's hard for us to completely forget it from our memory ever again. Right? And many of times it's in the back of our head, I don't know if I can trust this person but God says, not only will I forgive you, I will never remember what you've done against you. So when God is saying all these things, He's constantly saying, I will. That's the amazing thing about this new covenant, this new promise, is that it's all on God. It's not about us. God recognized the problem with the old promise was the people couldn't do it. And so what God is saying I'm going to do it. I will do these things for you. I will make the word refreshing to you. I will make you my people. I will be in this intimate relationship with you where you know me. I will forgive you and I will remember your wrongs no longer. I will do these things for you. So God desired that intimacy. This is what the author is trying to tell his audience. You are going back to Judaism. You are going back to religion. God wants you to have a relationship. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to experience Him. So as I said before, He's pursuing us. He's reaching out to us. It's not about us doing good things to get back into God's good graces. It's about Him running out. This is a, kind of a paradigm shift that I think many of us struggle with. Because I think a, a lot of us have this, like most of us when we talk about God, like I think the strongest image that most people will, will, will connect to is God as a father. Right? Most people when you talk to God about God, they're like, yeah, you know, he's, he's kind of like this father figure. And so there's that, that relationship, but in many, in many ways it feels like it still needs to be earned. Whereas the other image that we're given is that we are the bride of Christ, right? We are this, you know, we are essentially marrying God. And so in many ways, he's pursuing us. Right? We're that girl that's hard to get. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, that, that's that's how God sees us. He sees us with that much desire and with that much joy. He doesn't see us as someone that has to shape up or ship out. He's running after us. Like even the story of like the, the, the prodigal son, the, the line that, that always sticks out to me is that the father was running toward the son, even from far away. The moment he recognized that his son was returning, he ran. Right? And to me, that's the image of God. The moment he recognizes that, that we want to return to him, he's, he's already pursuing us, but he's running even harder. So that, that's the thing is, this is the main point that this author is trying to get across is, God is going after you, but you're trying to go back to the way things were before. You're going back to the old. <laughs> So this is, brothers and sisters, this is what grace is. Grace is something that all you do is receive it. 
There's nothing you do to earn it. This is what grace is. Even every single covenant, every single promise that God has made, it really wasn't about the other person. It really wasn't about anything they did to deserve that promise. It's always been grace. There's nothing Abraham did that necessarily made him worthy of that promise. But God gave it to him anyway. This is who God is. So when it comes to an understanding of what grace is, what, what, what the gospel is, what I really want to really emphasize today is just receive. Just receive. The Christian walk is not so much about doing it. Just receive the grace of God and everything else will work. So that's the, the challenge that this, this author is giving is live in the new. You're still going back to this old covenant. You're still going back to this old promise. Live in the new. Now, as I shared before, um, a lot of the things that this author is sharing would have been mind-blowing to many of the Jews. Number one, none of them knew who Melchizedek was. And so to realize that Christ was in the order of Melchizedek would have been mind-blowing. To really understand what that meant. And the, even this new covenant that's promised in Jeremiah 31, no one really understood what that meant either. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, like God wants to do all these things, but they didn't really understand what it really meant. Next chapter, we're going to talk more about what cost came from the new covenant. How did that new covenant happen? And that what cost? We're going to talk about the blood of Christ. But the main thing I want you to understand today is intimacy. The last thing God wants is for us to, like the people that this author was writing to, go back to religion. God doesn't want us to be a people that, you know, we come to Sunday because, you know, it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, we give our offering because it's the right thing to do. He doesn't want this to become that boring religion. God wants Sunday to be one of many days, if not every day, where you're engaging with Him. You're coming together as the people of God. You're worshiping together. You're meeting Him. You're meeting His presence here, but not just here. You also meet Him when you go back home. You also meet Him when, when you're, you're praying. You also meet Him when you're reading His Word. That's what it means to be a temple of God. You are constantly worshiping. So even for us here today, I want to encourage you guys that Sunday is not the only day to worship. Sunday is a great day. Don't get me wrong. Right, so I want you guys to be like, you know what, I'm a temple. I don't need to go to no church. <laughs> I'm going to just worship in my room every day. <laughs> Some people make that conclusion. And that's entirely wrong. As, as the Word tells us, we're meant to gather and worship together. That, that's an important thing of, of the Christian walk. But at the same time, worship is not a once a week thing. It's something that's constantly happening. And so for, for those of you that... that you know, struggle with this intimacy where God seems so far away and, you know, you, you know, you enjoy coming to Sunday services and that's great. I want to challenge you today to know that God wants a relationship. God wants you to constantly be engaging and talking with Him. So I'll say this one time, know the Lord. Because my hope is soon it will be clear that we all know the Lord. <laughs> know the Lord, brothers and sisters. Know that this is His heart. Know that this is His desire. <coughs> he doesn't want you to feel like you need to earn anything from Him. He just wants you to receive. Receive His grace. Receive His love. Receive His mercy. Let's take some time to pray. Then we'll go ahead and close for today. I just want us to take a moment to pray for our intimacy with God to increase. Now, if, if, if God has always felt like a distant figure in your life, if God has always felt far away, I want you to just pray that, that God would bring you into a closer intimacy.
that you would feel his presence, that you would recognize his hand in your everyday life and see that he is constantly pursuing after you. He is constantly running after you. So let's take some time to just pray for more intimacy in our relationship. that we need to be a certain person, that we need to do certain things. 